Well, it was after the death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth on a missionary journey somewhere in the Roman world, and Paul was in trouble, real trouble. Actually, this could be said about almost any city that Paul visited on any one of his missionary journeys. Everywhere he went from Antioch to Rome, as he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul faced persecution. This morning we consider the perspective that Paul had about this particular kind of trouble. If you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, perhaps I should say as I welcome our connectors, uh, particularly we've been considering all year in the President's Chapel messages, people from the Bible who were in trouble. And there's a long list of them, honestly. Almost everybody you meet in the Bible was in trouble at one point or another. And uh, certainly Paul faced as much trouble as anyone. And here we find, I think, a rather remarkable perspective on persecution. Because on the one hand, Paul is very honest about just how much trouble he and his friends were facing. In talking about their missionary experience, he uses words like afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. And yet actually he uses these words to draw a contrast between present outward troubles and God's inward strength to persevere. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8, we are afflicted in every way, he says, but not crushed. Although perplexed, not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. You have a sense of someone who is being brought to the very precipice of destruction and yet not one step beyond that. There's another contrast the Apostle draws here for us between what these earthly troubles feel like in the present moment and moment and what they will turn out to look like in the life to come. And he shows us here an eternity of difference between the agony that we face in this present darkness and the ecstasy we will experience forever in the brightness of God's everlasting glory. Now, in drawing these contrasts, Paul was talking about a particular kind of trouble. It's not a trouble that everyone faces, and it's not a trouble we've considered yet this year, but it is very common to the experience of the church in the world. It's the trouble that comes when Christians are persecuted for following Christ. And if anyone knew about this kind of trouble, it was the Apostle Paul. Uh, One of the first places he visited after he began his missionary work was Pisidian Antioch, and already on the second Sabbath there, some of the leading men and women of that city were stirring up persecution against Paul and driving him out of town. He went on to Iconium, and that visit lasted a little longer, but it wasn't too long before Jewish and Gentile leaders were conspiring together against Paul. He fled to Lystra, and there crowds actually stoned him and dragged him out of the city and left him for dead. But apparently Paul was only mostly dead because he got back up on his feet the next morning and uh, off he went on his missionary journey. And there are more stories about uh, Paul's persecutions than we have time to tell this morning. Philippi, he was beaten and thrown in prison. Corinth, brought up on false legal charges. Ephesus, huge riots against the Christian gospel. Jerusalem, Paul arrested there while worshiping at the temple. And people wanted to put him to death, and they would have done it too, except that some Roman soldiers showed up on the scene and saved his life. Honestly, unless we had all of these stories in the Bible, it might be hard to believe some of the summaries that Paul gives of the sufferings that he faced. He talks about enduring far more imprisonments than anyone else with countless beatings that left him often near death. Or listen to this list of the hardships he faced. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. 
a night and a day adrift on the open sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from river, rivers, from robbers, from my own people, from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, toil and hardship, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, Paul says, in cold and exposure. On another occasion, as he described the state of the church in the world, he said, to this present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed, buffeted, and homeless. We, we have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. The next time you are tempted to think that you have a lot of troubles in life, consider the sufferings of the Apostle Paul. That might help put things in perspective. But when Paul uh, listed all of these troubles, he wasn't, he wasn't having some kind of pity party. He wasn't trying to get people to feel sorry for him. He wasn't even bragging about how brave he was either. He was simply offering a straightforward account of what he had actually experienced with the purpose of helping people understand how the gospel was reflected in those experiences. In fact, when Paul lists the sufferings that he faced, you could almost say that he was giving a, a list of the answers to his prayers. Because one of his greatest ambitions in life was to share in the sufferings of Christ. This had been true really from the beginning of his Christian experience. When Paul first came to Christ on the Damascus Road, he was shown very clearly how much he would suffer for the sake of the gospel. And Paul embraced that. He said, I want to share in the sufferings of Christ, becoming like him in his death. Prayer answered. Just read the, the book of Acts. In fact, Paul describes suffering as a gift. It has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Talk about a gift that nobody wants. Nevertheless, Paul regarded persecution as a privilege of his apostleship. In fact, he even found joy in the suffering that he endured for Christ and his kingdom. In almost all of these passages where he talks about persecution, he testifies to the joy that he was finding in the goodness of God. He was always saying things like, I rejoice in what was suffered. I delight in persecutions. The point is not that he enjoyed these experiences any more than we would, but that he had a supernatural source of joy in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Paul has so much to teach us about what to do when trouble comes, something we've been trying to learn all year. Few of us, if any of us, will ever suffer anything close to what Paul endured. But I believe the sufferings that he faced are still very relevant to our own Christian experience. I say this partly because I think his persecution helps us count the high cost of Christian discipleship. I think it's important to understand that a decision to live for Christ is really a decision to die for Christ, if we are called to that. And so it is helpful for us to see what some Christians have suffered so that we may be sincere in our own commitment to follow Christ, no matter what. And I think these things are especially relevant for anyone here this morning who is called to go to one of the world's hardest places in the name of Jesus and share the gospel. Have you sensed that kind of calling in your life? Are you open to that kind of calling even if you haven't sensed it yet? Our mission as a college is to prepare students to build the church worldwide. And some of the places where God is building his church are some of the hardest places in the world. Is your life still open to that call or have you started to place limits on what you, what you will do and where you will go for Jesus? This passage is surely relevant if your life is open to that calling. But even if you don't go to one of the world's hardest places, you will still find yourself in some tight spots. You may, for example, be back with your friends from high school over the summer. And it will be a lot easier to go along with the crowd than to put up with the comments that you know people will make 
if you decide not to do some of the things they're doing or laugh at some of the things they're laughing about, and yet deep down you know that however much fun they seem to be having, what they say and what they do and what they laugh about is not honoring to God. There's a cost for that kind of discipleship. Or maybe you'll be uh, working at a job or in some kind of internship where you will face the very real temptation to keep your Christianity quiet, subtly and yet unmistakably turning a personal relationship with Jesus Christ into a private relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul's challenge for all of us through his example is to take a stronger stand. I believe further that what he suffered is relevant because it reminds us of the real persecution that the church is suffering around the world today. It's easy to focus on what is happening on campus or what's happening in your own life, maybe particularly on a beautiful day like this one, and miss seeing what is happening to other believers in other countries. According to the annual World Watch List compiled by Open Doors, more than 1,000 churches were attacked in 2014, and more than 4,000 Christians were killed. Have you followed the news on some of these killings? In Nigeria, the militant Islamic organization Boko Haram has announced publicly its intention to, quote unquote, cleanse the country of all Christians. In the words of their leaders, this is a war against Christians. Allah says we should finish them when we get them. And to that end, jihadist terrorists have burned churches, destroyed villages, kidnapped hundreds of teenage girls, most of them Christians. In fact, in the first week of this year, Boko Haram attacked fishing villages on Lake Chad and killed more than 2,000 people, many of them women and children who were fleeing from the village in boats that were overcrowded and then capsized. Many victims drowned. There have been similar, victim, uh, similar attacks in Niger where Islamic protests against the French magazine Charlie Hebdo have led to the destruction of 70 churches. Attacks are very common in northern Syria where the Islamic State known as ISIS has driven nearly a million Christians from their homes in the last eight months. The same thing is happening in northern Iraq. I was so grieved to learn that this Easter, as a result of the attacks there, for the first time in more than 1,500 years, the church bells were silent on Easter morning. Many of the homes of Christians in that city have been marked with a black N, N for Nazarene, referring to Jesus. There were horrific executions in Libya, the beheadings there on the seacoast, the attack on the Garissa University College in Kenya, where Christians were separated from Muslims on the basis of whether they could recite verses from the Koran, and 150 students, many of them the first People, first children from their families to go on to higher education were killed in cold blood. These things are not accidental. These things are intentional. One of the ISIS uh, declarations said, this is a message to the nation of the cross. We will conquer your Rome. We will break your crosses. We will enslave your women. You are a member of that cruciform kingdom. Have you considered what God is calling you to do in response? Are you praying for the persecuted church? Are you asking the question, is there anything that we can do to help? A student recently wrote to me and asked this question, why is Wheaton College focusing so little on the crisis and persecution of our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Western Africa? Members of Chicago's Jewish community have asked me the same question. One rabbi commented that if Jews had been beheaded in Libya rather than Christians, the worldwide Jewish community would have been crying out for their family members. And yet he could not perceive a similar kind of outrage and sense of solidarity in the church with our brothers and sisters in the faith. I think one way to build that sense of solidarity is simply to be aware of the sufferings of the persecuted church. But I think it is also important for us to understand why God permits his 
beloved sons and daughters to suffer and even to die for the sake of the gospel. Where is God in all of this? What is his purpose for this particular kind of trouble? And what should we do when such trouble comes? I think that's a hard question for us, but it was not a particularly difficult question for Paul. Now, we see very clearly in his writings a sense of exactly why it is that Christians are persecuted everywhere they go. And Paul understood this to be an important part, even a necessary part of God's plan. He explains this here in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, we are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Why? So that, verse 12, the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul is saying that in some mysterious way, the pattern of Good Friday and of Easter Sunday, the pattern of the cross and the empty tomb, that that is getting repeated in the experience of the church. And this is happening for the evangelization of the lost. There is something about seeing the endurance of believers suffering for the sake of Christ that helps unbelievers understand the message of the gospel. They, they can't see Jesus hanging on the cross, but they can see a community that is sharing in his suffering, and God often uses this to bring new spiritual life out of spiritual death. A church marked by the cross through its suffering in the world is a living testimony to the gospel of a risen Christ. And this explains why Paul was not crushed, not driven to despair, not feeling forsaken, not destroyed, even if he was afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. He could see that God was using his sufferings for the salvation of the lost. He, he says this in verse 15, as grace extends to more and more people, he says, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. This is what is happening in my ministry, in the ministry of those who are suffering with me in their missionary work. This is Paul's testimony. I think all of this calls us to a particular kind of prayer. A prayer that the sufferings of our brothers and sisters will not be in vain. That it will fulfill God's purpose. That people will come to faith in the living Christ. When you hear the sad news that brothers and sisters are being persecuted, and indeed there was such news just this morning. There were people emigrating from Libya to Italy. The boats were crowded, and Muslim passengers pushed 12 Christians to their death. I don't know if this happened just yesterday, but the news was out this morning. When we hear this kind of news, we should raise a cry of lamentation. We should grieve for our brothers and sisters, but, but we should not despair, but should understand this is part of God's purpose, and we enter into that purpose when we remember to pray for their witness. Last September, Pastor Saeed Abedini wrote a letter to his daughter Rebecca on the occasion of her eighth birthday. He wrote the letter from the cell of an Iranian prison where for years he has been held captive for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, this was the third consecutive year that he would miss his little girl's birthday. And here is what he wrote. My dearest Rebecca Grace, happy eighth birthday. You, you are growing so fast and becoming more beautiful every day. Oh, how I long to see you. I know that you question why you have prayed so many times for my return, and yet I am not home yet. Now there is a big why in your mind. And you are asking, why isn't Jesus answering my prayers? The answer to the why is who? Who is in control? Lord Jesus Christ, he is in control. Jesus allows me to be kept here for his glory. People die and suffer for their Christian faith all over the world. Some may wonder why, but you should know the answer of why is who. It is for Jesus, and he is worth the price. 
This is a father's testimony to his young daughter. And it is a testimony that surely reflects an experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit, the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit in his suffering. Pastor Abedini experienced the same thing that Paul experienced whenever he was in prison, and that is the very presence of God in comfort, in peace, and in power. And this too should call us to prayer. We may not always be able to alleviate the sufferings of a persecuted church, although sometimes we can do that. But whether we can give our brothers and sisters any practical help or not, we can at least pray for the peace of God's presence, not only their witness to others, but also their own experience of God's grace. Recently, the National Association of Evangelicals, and I am now privileged to serve on the board of that organization as the leadership was reflecting on the experience of the church, how many things have been suffered by the church, particularly in recent months. It expressed in, its, in, a, in a public statement collective grief and profound concern for the suffering of Christians around the world. It went on to explain, our brothers and sisters in Christ are being persecuted, uprooted from their ancestral homes, even martyred because of their faith. And then the statement called Christians everywhere to engage in sustained prayer for those who lo whose lives are threatened, especially for family members of martyrs who have been brutally killed, and as we have the opportunity to give generously to the needs of refugees and to rebuild shattered communities. God will answer these prayers, and he will answer them by sending the kind of help that he always sends when his people are in trouble. The, the Bible says God is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, in ways that surpass merely human understanding. The close presence of God's Spirit gives hope in the darkness to the persecuted church. And for the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest of those comforts was knowing that whatever he was going through was only temporary, and that therefore, in the light of eternity, it was of only minimal consequence. I look at the, a list of the man's troubles, and uh, it seems to amount to something to me. I mean, it's, it's hard even to imagine how he survived sometimes, let alone how Paul stayed faithful to the cause of Christ. In fact, sometimes it, it seemed that way to Paul himself. On one occasion, he said, we're under great pressure. It's far beyond our ability to endure. We, we're despairing of life itself. We feel like there's a death sentence against us. But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the apostle dismisses all of that suffering with a little wave of his hand and calls it, notice the expression in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, he calls all of that a light, momentary affliction. Christian suffering is momentary because this life is only the merest prelude to an infinite eternity. After we die, we will rise again and then live forever. Paul was absolutely certain about this, that the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. He testifies to that here in verse 14, and that's why he didn't lose heart even when he was persecuted. The resurrection of Christ equals the resurrection of the Christian. And therefore, in this life, we have nothing to lose, only life to gain. And when we do rise again, we will enter such unimaginable glory that all of life's troubles, all of it, everything that we're going through, including all of the persecution that the people of God have suffered, all of that will simply fade away. Because this light, momentary affliction, as Paul calls it, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And he says, we are not looking to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. We're not looking to the transient things. We are looking to the things that are eternal. And I believe you will find that the people who really believe this, the people who hold on to the cross and who look in hope for God's weightier glory, those are the people that do the most good in the world, who have the most patience, 
who display the most endurance, who do the most for Christ and his kingdom in every hard and difficult place. Recently, I read a notable example of that kind of endurance from the life of Clarence Jordan. I want to close with this illustration. Jordan was a man of unusual ability. He held doctorates in Greek, Hebrew, and agriculture. That's quite a combination. As gifted as he was, he dedicated his life to serving the poor. In the 1940s, he founded Koinonia Farm in Americus, Georgia, a farm where poor whites and poor blacks could live together in Christian community. That was their vision. Well, a multiracial community like Koinonia Farm faced severe hostility in the segregated South of the 1940s, and sadly, much of it came from church members. People in town tried a number of things to stop Clarence Jordan. They boycotted his produce. They slashed the tires of his workers. Finally, one night in 1954, the Ku Klux Klan came and tried to get rid of him once and for all. They set fire to every building on the farm except Clarence's house, which they riddled with bullets. The next day, a newspaper reporter came out to see the farm's smoldering remains and found to his astonishment, Dr. Jordan outside hoeing and planting. Heard the awful news, the reporter said. I came out to do a story on the tragedy of your farm closing. Jordan kept working the soil. The reporter kept pestering for some kind of response. And finally, he said, well, Dr. Jordan, you've got two PhDs and you've put 14 years into this farm. There's nothing left of it at all. Just how successful do you think you've been? Well, that provoked a response. Clarence Jordan stopped working, leaned on his hoe, and he looked the reporter straight in the eye. He said, about as successful as the cross. And he said, sir, I don't think you understand us. We, what we are about is not success, but faithfulness. And so we are staying to do God's work. Now, I hope I do hope, as someone who loves and cares about you, that your life will be spared any serious persecution. But if such trouble comes, I pray that you will see it for what it is, a light and momentary affliction. And further, that your service to Christ will be as successful as the cross. And by the power of the risen Lord Jesus, you will live in expectation of a weighty glory. Our Father, we do pray with this hope that we would gain an eternal weight of glory and that this hope would encourage us to persevere through every present trouble. For Jesus' sake and in his name, amen.